Welcome back to the shop, folks. This will be sort of a video retrospective, kind of a case study on this thing that I designed and fabricated. This is a flexible button pad. It's kind of a little USB keyboard that I tried to make flexible and magnetic. So it's got this outer shell made from 3D printable flexible plastic. So in this case, NinjaFlex. And then the buttons are all basically taps on a resistor divider. So when you press one, it picks an analog voltage, presents that to a teensy microcontroller. And that was a really good way of getting this circuit compact and into a form that I could turn into a really simple single layer circuit board. And so every time you press a button, it gives you a different analog voltage. And then this microcontroller samples those voltages and the Teensy is actually a really convenient device to emulate a keyboard with because this is really already built into the Arduino integration. So my first challenge was what kind of switch to use and how to actually design something using flexible materials that would still give kind of a good tactile keycap feel on top of that. And so my thought was to design something that went in between the tactile switch itself and your finger that would stay pretty rigid but have a loose coupling to the surround uh, where the rest of the keys were mounted. So I had some experience with designing things out of this NinjaFlex material before using the tactile switches. So I tried something similar. Here I was just modeling everything uh, in Rhino. Uh, I was trying to figure out what the overall shape I had to work with was. So I kind of made a mock-up out of paper uh, sized to fit the mill that I was planning on using to make the flexible circuit board. And then uh, started modeling that and then using that as an outline for the rest of the design. So I just kind of put down some arcs that seemed like potentially ergonomic ways to move my wrist while I was using the keypad, and then started placing buttons along those within the space that I had available. And then I had to make a model for the Teensy, since I couldn't find one of those handy. And then I designed an attachment point for that, where there would be a sort of little tongue that I could solder it to on the flexible circuit board that I'd be making. So at that point, I had an outline, which I could export from Rhino and then import into KiCad and then use that to design the, the circuits kind of when that, within the envelope. So I designed my simple schematic in KiCad. Here's the resistor ladder and something that I expected to be able to fabricate in a single layer. And then placing all the parts according to the layout that I had exported from Rhino. This was a pretty manual process, putting all the resistors next to their corresponding switches, petting the cat, lining everything up just right, and then doing a lot of routing I really enjoyed using the KiCad push and shove router for this because I was trying to get all the traces to really line up in a narrow path between the switches so that I could then cut the circuit board in a zigzag pattern that would make it extra flexible since I thought that having kind of a single large sheet of this flexible circuit material wouldn't end up producing a keypad that was nearly as flexible as I needed it to be. So here I'm just kind of nudging all the traces close together and it's checking the design rules as I go. Then to generate the actual outline of the flexible circuit, I didn't see an easy way of doing that in KiCad. So I ended up exporting that again back to Rhino and then using this kind of node-based programming environment in Rhino called Grasshopper to create kind of offset versions of all the traces. And then I Booleaned those together into a shape that represented kind of a minimum distance from all the traces and then manually went in and cleaned up some of the rougher areas myself to make it into a better outline shape. And that's what I used to uh, generate this kind of weird final outline that you see me finally importing back into KiCad. So now the flex circuit design's done and I can move on to manufacturing. So I export Gerber files and here I'm just importing it into other plan to just check the fit, make sure things are probably gonna be fine. And then it's into the machining closet where I prepare a layer of thin plastic. In this case, I just used some Kydex that I had handy. And then I mill that completely flat. In this case, my mill has a spoil board, which is flat, but it also has bolt holes. So in this case, I was able to give myself a flat surface that was uniform across the entire bed. And then I prepared some of this Pyrolux, which is copper and basically Kapton tape laminated together with an additional layer of Kapton tape to give myself a little bit more clearance on the backside for milling. And then I glued that to the bed of that uh, freshly faced bit of plastic that I had just prepared, squeegee it down nice and flat. 
And then the milling operation here is a little bit tedious because I have to very carefully nudge down the Z height so that the mill is carving away the copper but not damaging the two layers of Kapton tape on the opposite side. So I get it pretty close. There's one place where I think there was a bit of a sag in the, uh, the plastic layer, but I did a milling job that I was pretty happy with. And once I had completed that, I cleaned it off as much as I cared to. And then I added another layer of Kapton tape on top to act as the, effectively the, the same function as a solder mask, kind of a, an extra insulating layer. So here's the almost complete board ready to be cut out. And then I used the mill to cut it out, and here's where things went kind of wrong. You can see the, the carnage. I think the, that bit, that, that tool in my mill might have been a little bit dull, or maybe it just would have been bad work holding, like maybe, uh, maybe the glue wasn't enough to hold it as I was cutting it. So you can see I got kind of a nasty edge, but otherwise things seemed, seemed like they uh, went all right. So I'm getting it off the mill. You can see it's very flexible, still has a lot of glue on the backside. And at this point, it seems promising, like, oh, that might be flexible enough. So I'm trying to clean off all the junk from the edges. And this kind of works, but actually putting it on some scrap paper and then making these kind of slicing motions worked really nicely. I just didn't get much of that footage on camera. And then to make it easier to work with, I'm gluing it down to some stiff paper, since it's very, very floppy otherwise. And then another fairly manual process where I go through and use a knife to remove that top layer of Kapton over all the pads that I'll be soldering to. A little bit of electrical testing with the multimeter just to uh, find any shorts as early as possible, but then it's off to soldering the buttons. So I started with just tacking them each down by one corner so that I could get the positioning right, and then I can go back and solder the other three, the other three terminals. And then prepared the connection to the TNC over there with kind of a lap joint where solder sits in between the through holes and a, uh, an exposed pad on the flex PCB. Then mounting the resistors, each button has its corresponding resistor in the ladder just next door. And I use the same strategy here of just tacking down one side of each resistor and then going back and soldering both sides. So then I was testing out some of the 3D printed designs that were starting to come out. I was trying different ways of distributing the force down to the tactile switch, different ways of keeping the buttons level as they were pressed off center. I iterated on this design a few times, but I didn't end up finding anything I liked, so I ended up switching strategies. So then I decided to go with something that had hard plastic inserts that could have a rigid end stop that kept the button from getting too far off angle, and it would sort of act as a lever to distribute the force back to the tactile switch in the very center. So I went ahead with that, did a lot more CAD, modeled a little cozy place for the teensy to go, including some supports to hold the board in place and features to make it printable. I started adding some little icons to the top of each button that would help me identify them by feel and checking printability and slicing it. So then I printed the flexible body of the enclosure in two pieces, this kind of bulky top section that includes the buttons and the teensy enclosure and then a pretty flat secondary piece. They both have matching holes for the magnets to slot into, and the bottom piece also has a bit of a recess for the circuit board. So I'm starting to get ready to glue the top and the bottom pieces together. My plan is to use this E6000 adhesive, and I 3D printed this other piece that'll help me hold the two halves together. I've got the hard inserts ready to go in a few different colors. And so I'm just putting things together and starting to try this out and test fit all the pieces before I actually commit to gluing it. And I start testing out the buttons. And here's where things start to go a little sideways. I start to notice that a few of the buttons are acting erratically and especially clustered in one side. And so it seemed like they had some uh, kind of non-conductive debris stuck inside them. So I tried just rinsing them off with isopropanol and blowing them out with compressed air. Then I started preparing the magnets by gluing them into their little wells in the thin piece so that I could let that glue set before I handled this piece too much more. And similarly, to make things easier to handle, I tried using some spray adhesive on the back side of the circuit board, hoping that I could use this to stick it to the, uh, to the thin flexible piece. This didn't really turn out to be a good idea. It didn't hold the board super well, and I think the adhesive might have made my problems with non-conductive debris even worse, although the problems were certainly there even before I used this particular adhesive. 
I'm not totally sure of the original source of the contamination, but I think my best guess is that it was excess flux while soldering the buttons, or maybe some of the adhesive from the top layer of Kapton tape. Definitely some kind of adhesive or flux getting inside the buttons and in between the conductive bits. So this jig was designed to press the two halves together everywhere except where the two pieces were supposed to remain separate, since that was a kind of concern of mine while I was assembling this. So I had to pick a color scheme, assemble all the hard inserts, give it one final test before I really commit to things. Actually, nope. More cleaning. Lots more cleaning. Isopropanol. Little pieces of wood, agitating it, compressed air, testing it with the multimeter, just so much cleaning and drying. Then finally, after all the buttons seemed to be working reliably, then I was starting to assemble it for actually gluing the pieces together. So here's the top piece inside the little jig that holds all the flat parts together, layering the circuit board and making sure everything lines up. And then I had to manually apply glue to all the right locations with a little stick, get the glue in all the areas that had to adhere and avoid all the moving parts, and then just press it all together using that printed jig. Give it a little bit of time, I think overnight, then pull it apart and see what I've got. <laughs> all sorts of stickiness in there, like some kind of alien egg. This E6000 glue just kind of peels apart after it's cured when there's excess. I can just peel the whole thing out of the mold. And I think already I'm noticing that it's maybe a little stiffer than I wanted it to be, but it does seem to mostly be holding together. So yeah, it's not quite as flexible in that, that axis, kind of bending it in the short direction. But overall, it seems to have held together all right, and it certainly looks nice. The E6000 adhesive is fairly transparent with the rest of these materials, and the buttons have an all right feel to them. It seems reasonably durable, but I'm sticking it on the pole there and it's not really flexible enough to actually stick there. And the magnets are not pulling it into alignment. So I thought I'd try an alternate strategy. Here I am disassembling it, undoing all my hard work of gluing it together, peeling off the glue, getting it off the circuit board and off of all the pieces. So I was thinking the problem was really how this didn't allow the layers to slide. It kind of bonded them all together, making the whole assembly pretty stiff. So I thought I'd try something different. I assembled it without any glue, and then I sort of used an old soldering iron tip to heat stake the layers together, kind of sewing the edges together. So this allowed the bulk of the material to slide and stretch independently, but it still attached it together around the magnets and around the edges, you know, in a couple of structurally relevant places, kind of sealed together at the end near the USB port. And that produced something that I was a lot happier with. The whole thing was still not as flexible as I really wanted, but a lot more flexible. And I think the remaining stiffness is mostly down to the design of that front assembly. You could probably use some optimization. It's still not flexible enough to actually fit onto the pole, which was a major shortcoming in this design. But it's pretty fun on flat metal surfaces. So for a while I was just sticking this to the top of my power supply. This is the Arduino IDE where I'm just taking a look at the analog values coming out of those buttons. And then I ended up graphing those. You can see a few interesting things. That kind of long tail indicates that it takes a while to fully discharge to zero. But all the steps on the right side correspond to the actual keys that we're pressing. So I made a lookup table based on those values and wrote a little Arduino sketch that calculates the key closest to the analog reading we're getting, and then presses it. And you can see typing out A, B, C, D, E, F, etc. And then I modified that sketch to also press the Shift and Alt modifier keys. And this gives me some keys that are a little more useful for hot keying in Open Broadcast Studio. So now I can press buttons on here and change cameras or other settings on OBS while I stream. Well, and that really concludes this build and really this experiment. I was hoping that this would turn into something that I ended up using every day in my streaming. And I used this for a while, but I ended up having some further problems with the button reliability. And it just wasn't really that convenient of a shape. Uh, it didn't really stick to my desk area. So I ended up replacing it with this long skinny thing made by X keys, which serves a similar purpose. I do miss having the different shapes on each keycap though. 
So that might be a future project to try to replicate that feel. But in the meantime, this was a really useful project to teach myself about some new fabrication techniques and some new ways to use this flexible filament. This was my first time really uh, trying to do this much with flexible electronics, and I think it was an interesting experience trying to see what worked and what didn't. This was my second time doing a DIY flexible circuit board, and my first time trying to do a fully flexible assembly like this. Well, I hope you enjoyed watching. If you did, uh, maybe check out some of my other videos. There might be some stuff you like there too. And if you like my work, then uh, consider heading over to patreon.com slash scanlime. And even just chipping in a dollar a month will help me continue making these videos, will help me keep the lights on in the shop, and it'll really help me uh, keep doing this thing. So uh, I really appreciate everyone who pitches in. And even if you just watch my videos and tell your friends, that's super helpful. So thanks so much, and happy hacking, everyone. I will see you on the internet. If you want to find out when I do live streams, you can subscribe or follow at Scanlime Live on Twitter. Both will uh, notify you when the streams happen. I will see you then.